Today we're joined by Ryan Juni. He started five companies worth over $300 million, was a part-time partner at Y Combinator, which is a famous startup accelerator that has helped start companies like Airbnb, Reddit, Twitch, etc., which are collectively worth over $400 billion. And fun fact, he even gave a lecture to the now famous Gary Tan once. We'll get to that story later. And if all of the above was enough, he also makes YouTube videos, invests in startups, and I'm actually co-founding a stealth startup right now with Ryan. Big news coming up soon. But anyways, in the next hour, we'll start with a story, then deep dive on philosophy and spirituality. For example, we talk about intuition versus logic, coined new terms like the approximation ladder. Hell, we even talked about polyamory at one point. Trust me, you're gonna wanna watch all the way till the end because there's so much wisdom we're about to unpack. All right, let's get started. Hey Ryan, so as always, could you briefly tell us what was your first company and how did you get into startups? So I'm an entrepreneur and investor. I've been doing that for the last 15, 16 years, mostly in Silicon Valley. I was in a PhD program at Stanford, but I realized pretty quickly that I would much rather get out there into the real world. So I left and I got into the whole entrepreneurship game in Silicon Valley. So my first company I started in 2007 it was called Omnisio. It was an online video editing platform. Long story short, ended up getting accepted into Y Combinator back when YC was tiny, we had like 20 companies in our batch. We used to have dinner at Paul Graham's house. And long story short, ended up selling that company to YouTube about 18 months into the company. Wow, there's so many things I want to ask, but let's just start with when you talk about you started your first company and you guys were in the earliest batch of Y Combinator and you said you got dinners with Paul Graham. Yeah. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, so it wasn't the very first batch. The first batch was in 2005, but this was 2007, I think, when the batches were you know, much smaller than they are today. Everyone knew each other really well. We would go and see Paul and the rest of the YC partners down at their office in Mountain View every week, have dinners there. It was just a, a very like family feel. Any famous names in there, like Gary Tan uh, or anyone else that we know? Oh, about in my in YC that? batch? Yeah. So I've done YC twice, actually. I'll come back to that. But you mentioned Gary Tan. He was actually in the batch after we were. And I know that because after I sold my company to Google, I went back to YC to talk as you know, a YC alum saying, hey, here's how I sold my company to Google, which a lot of the founders in the audience were eager to learn and hear about. And Gary Tam was one of the founders in that audience. And the, the way I became friends with him is because he's always been a great photographer and he took some photos of me while I was talking to YC and me with Paul and Jessica. So I became friends with Gary and we stayed in touch over the years. And he became a partner at YC and started his own fund after that. Now he's a, a, an amazing YouTuber and now he's giving me advice on how to start my YouTube channels. How did you identify that opportunity at Y Combinator? So Paul was very smart in creating this site called Hacker News. And that site attracted a lot of people with hacker founder mentalities. And I think it was probably through Hacker News that I heard of Y Combinator. It sounded interesting. So we filled out the form and actually got an interview and got an offer. And so I guess it was meant to be. Yeah. Any of that, would you say was a result of some mental models that you've used to try to optimize for serendipity? Because it's almost like Bitcoin, right? You could be really lucky, but actually I would say a lot of people that did discover Bitcoin, like they have this mental model of trying new things. I think there's something interesting there about the type of people that can consistently find these new opportunities and just take it. Yeah. What do you think that is? I think, no, I think you're right. I think it's less of a mental model to optimize for serendipity as it is for just following your curiosity and trusting your gut. So Bitcoin's a great example. I first discovered Bitcoin back in 2012 and I was curious about it. I went and bought a few Bitcoins back when they were $10 just to see what this thing no is. Way. And actually around, oh yeah. And around the time that we were thinking about starting Parsable, my third company, my co-founder and I were actually working on two ideas in parallel. One was a Bitcoin based idea to actually build a, like an online lottery <laughs> website. It's kind of as a joke. And so that all comes from just following curiosity and trusting your gut. So when you ask how, how did I decide to pursue Y Combinator, it was, let's just do it. Why not? It doesn't have to be this big rational analysis. What are the pros and cons? And I could do this and that could lead to that. Like the intellectual brain and the rational analysis is a very useful tool to be used in a lot of situations, but some of us tend to rely overly too much on it. That's one thing I've learned from my whole spiritual path. And sometimes there's, you just got to follow the wisdom of your gut and the curiosity and what's exciting to you. And that can lead to, you know, the serendipity or the big opportunities. How would you be able to differentiate when you want to trust your gut and when you want to do that rational analysis? Because I, I can see easily how trusting your gut works really well for someone who is very curious. Uh, but let's say about 
So other examples include anti-curiosity, gut feeling. So for example, some people see something and they're like, I should try that. I want to stay away from Bitcoin maybe because that's like, I might right. lose all my life savings. It was like 2013. And it's, this is my hypothesis just now. I'm thinking like, what if that really your gut, that's a predetermined thing from childhood experiences. We, we talk about like the whole exploitation, exploration trade-off yeah. in another episode. And just for context for uh, the audience, basically in reinforcement learning, which is like a subfield of AI, let's say you want to design an AI that can solve a game, right? That can get a high score on the game. You want to have this trade-off between when you want to exploit and when you want to explore. Exploit means taking all the data points that you have and then continue that route to maximize points. So let's say you found that one path going to the end of the Mario flag is like you jump up, jump to the side and then jump up again and then you win, right? But what if there's a better way? What if it's better to jump up and then jump up again and then jump up again and then go down? So you want to find this trade-off between like when you want to explore new options versus just going down the existing path that you already know works pretty well. And this applies pretty much everywhere in every decision that we make. And I think it's almost a foundational setting that we all have. And it's determined a lot on our early childhood experiences. And if a kid was exposed to a lot of, let's say Lego, right? For me, it was like Minecraft and uh, coding game hacking software. And that gave me a lot more confidence in exploring because I made a lot of money from that. So I'm curious what you think of one like this hypothesis that the actual core cause of trusting your gut is not that trusting your gut is a good mental model, is that the actual root cause of why it was a good mental f- model for you was because that you had a really good exploit explore setting and you were just naturally curious and maybe it doesn't work for other people. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, there's so many sub questions in that question to unpack. I think it's a, a rich space for, for us to talk about. I think, you know, your point about being at it being based on your childhood experiences and upbringing is a good one. This whole exploration, exploitation thing, you know, in, in computer science, we call it, you know, the, the idea of optimizing for the global maxima versus a local maxima in pathfinding algorithms, you can get stuck in a, a local peak when reality view actually went down the dip, there's a bigger peak further away that you could explore. And that's kind of the benefit of exploration over just focusing on the local maxima. But the question of, you know, intuition or intellect, it's it's a big one that I think a lot about and I'm very passionate about. And I don't think it's an or, it's a, it's a both. I think of it think of it as two-dimensional. It's a matrix. You've got intellect and you've got intuition. Why not bring all your intellect and all your in- intuition when making a decision or taking an action? So you can train both your intellect and your intuition. Most of us you know, who are, who are technical probably naturally gravitate towards or probably are naturally blessed with the skill of having a pretty good intellect and a rational mind from birth or from genetics, but you can also train it. You can, you know, I studied computer science at university and aside from learning how to program, which I actually already knew how to program, what I got from my computer science education was how to think rationally, how to break down complex problems into the smaller parts and how to build them back up again, et cetera. So you can train intellectual thinking. You can also train intuitive thinking. And it's harder to do, but it, it it's something you've got to try and practice and observe if it worked or not and have some kind of feedback loop. But your subconscious mind is processing way more data per second than your conscious mind is. And so these ideas that occur to you intuitively are probably rising out for some some subconscious process that's way too complex for our conscious mind to analyze rationally, but there's value in that. And I think the subconscious mind is also, it does also contain a lot of filters about how it perceives the world. And those filters are created and modified in childhood and over the course of your life. And so if you had a childhood where taking risks was rewarded and encouraged, you would have subconscious filters that naturally seek out more risky actions or more risky, I don't know, concepts. Whereas if you were punished for taking risk or had bad experiences, bad results from taking risk, you'll have a subconscious filter of being, of when you see something risky, a fear response will arise in your body, causing that kind of open brainstorming mode to collapse down into like almost a fight or flight response. And it's going to shut down any 
intuition emerging because of that that fear. So I think a big part is understanding your childhood experiences, your childhood traumas, unpacking them. You can do a lot of work to go in and figure out what filters have I got in there. It's very hard to see your own filters. It's best to work with other people because they can see you more clearly than you can see yourself. But you should always endeavor to become clear on what subconscious filters you have running They'll always be there. You can never get rid of them because they're burnt into your nervous system, but you can become aware of them and you can notice when they're being triggered. And then you can bring your conscious mind to that awareness and say, I noticed this trauma or this story or this brain pattern is being triggered. I don't want to actually play that out like like I always have. Let me take a different action this time. So you can overcome it with with rational thought, but this is where you need to balance your rational intellect and your intuition. And sometimes you want your intellect to overpower your intuition, other times not. There's also this field, I think it's called biodynamics, I learned about, which I found was a really interesting analogy of risk-taking behavior and how it manifests even in early childhood, like even before you can walk. And so these people studied young toddlers learning how to walk for the first time. And they noticed the strategy that some toddlers would use is they would just like try and get up and like fall on their face and try and get up and fall on their face and try and get up and fall on their face. And they'll just keep going over and over because there was some goal that they could see, like a toy that they wanted. And they just wanted to get to it no matter how. They'll try and fail, try and fail, try and fail until eventually they learned how to walk. And so in this methodology, they call them forward fallers. And then there's another type of um, toddler they noticed who was much more strategic. Like I see that toy and I want to walk over to it, but instead of just trying and failing and trying and failing, they th- they think maybe if I like lean on this table, I can kind of leverage myself up a little bit, get up slowly, strategize and plan about how to get that toy. And when they did fall, those people would tend to fall backwards because they were getting up kind of slowly and strategically, then they would fall backwards. And they would just try they would have a plan about how to get up and it might take them longer to get up. But once they did, they were like, now they were up and they could walk over to the toy. And so they noticed a, a correlation between toddlers that were forward fallers versus backward fallers. Later in life, the forward fallers tend to be more risk taking, tend to be more the person that would just take action, try anything, doesn't matter. And if it fails, who cares? Let's try something else. Versus the backwards fallers were people who were very strategic thinkers, like, okay, here's the problem. Now let me analyze how I could solve this. Let me come up with all the options, pros and cons, cost-benefit analysis. This one seems like the best one. Let me go and do that. So I'm a backwards faller, and that's how I approach most things in life. I'm very strategic thinking. It takes me a long time before I take my first action. But when I take that first action, it's very well thought out and likely to succeed. Whereas my business partner is a forward faller. He's just action oriented. He'll just take action. Doesn't matter what, just do something. He's like, feels nervous or anxious if he's not doing something. So he will just do something and eventually like you'll do the right thing. And so that's why we, we work well together as, as business partners, because if, if me by myself, I bias more towards too much thinking and not enough action. Him by himself, he biases towards too much just action in random chaotic directions. If we combine my strategic thinking with his bias for action, that's how we actually end up finding the right path and going down at a full speed. So becoming aware of that in yourself, it's kind of related to this intellect intuition. It's slightly different, but it's all connected inside anyway. I think you have to know yourself really well understand your filters and biases and then just practice practice using your intuition and observe the result everything i say in these worlds of like spirituality or more esoteric things i never say like here's how it is and believe me i don't expect people to believe anything on faith because i don't i'm very empirical like just try it try it for yourself and see if you believe it (laughs) If you do, great. If you don't, don't. It doesn't bother me. But the things that I believe in my like spiritual belief system or more esoteric beliefs are things that I've just empirically tried and based on my own data and my current understanding of reality, I believe to be true. And I can also change that in any moment. But it's it's driven from what I've experimented with and seen work. So I encourage, I encourage self-exploration and empirical analysis. There's three things I find really yeah. interesting about that. So the first thing I found yep. interesting is when you talk about you and your partner balancing each other out. But why is that? It's it's almost have this collective intelligence. Like it's it's viewing two people as like a collective intelligence and and also viewing companies that way. There's this formula that you can use to find what works best. And and what we talked about earlier about forward follower, backward follower, that's a really interesting connection. I'm really curious 
about even other tangents that this can lead into. What are other foundational metrics or foundational settings that people have? And what are the best combinations for co-founders or for working in a team? So that's the first thing. Now, the the second thing I found interesting also is near the end, you talked about how it's very empirical uh, and you should try it and then see. And my current thought process on it is I think most of what we actually call truth is subjective on the amount of confidence you have in that truth, at least for psychological truths. So what I mean by that is let's say it's, you have this tactic that's like, if you use this tactic, you will be more productive. I think that the reason if that worked for you is actually if you believe in that. And then I also believe that you can manufacture belief in that as well, which that itself, it's also loose back to itself, or it's like you can manufacture the belief that you can manufacture the belief. And what, what that really connects to and why I truly believe in that is not just because of, I've seen an article on it or I, I believe in these like woo woo, like guru things, but actually it's, I, I think it has a deep connection with the placebo effect in science. hundred percent. The mind the and the brain is super powerful and the placebo effect is a perfect example of that. And it's the same, it's literally the same concept playing out in your belief system. If you believe something to be true about the world, you're probably going to subconsciously put yourself in situations to make that true about the world. And so your beliefs affect your experience of the world, maybe even more than your experience of the world affects your belief. Maybe the causality is actually the other way around, but in any case, they definitely influence each other. So it's important to understand what subconscious beliefs you hold and how you're programmed in some sense so that you can be consciously aware of that and choose to keep those beliefs around or discard them for updated beliefs. Yeah, I find that really interesting because these placebo effects, a lot of times people would just call it like woo. So law of attraction, for example, where they think, you know, the science doesn't make sense. I've spent a lot of time thinking about some of these spiritual things, woo-woo things. And a lot of them I believe in, by the way, through empirical personal experience. And I try to think, how how do I explain them to someone who's very rational or is a rationalist? And is there a way to explain them? And I think it does tie back 100% to the placebo effect. And it almost doesn't matter what the rational explanation of how something works is like if you're a scientist and a researcher and you want to understand how the universe works, then the understanding the mechanism of why it works might be really important to you. And if you've got that passion, go explore it. But for most of us, it almost doesn't matter like what's the mechanism by which this works. What matters is it works, which is why it was always confusing to me why the placebo effect is almost sometimes viewed as like a negative thing. It's like, oh no, that that drug doesn't really work. It's just a placebo. But if taking that drug coupled with the placebo effect of your mind makes it work, then all that matters is it worked, right? It healed you or gave you some effect that you wanted. It's the same with most spiritual beliefs. Like for example, many years ago, I studied Reiki, which is this form of energy healing where you put your hands on the body and through like energetic transmission, you can like heal the body. Now, I don't know if the, the way they describe how Reiki works is this energy flowing through the universe, through me, through my hands into the person is how it actually works or if it's a placebo effect, or if it's some other mechanism entirely, sub- subconscious body language communication going on, who knows what it could be, but it doesn't matter because it works. Like I, I did many experiments myself where I would do Reiki on someone without really telling them what I'm doing and and seeing if they would react in a certain way. And I saw enough reactions for me to think, okay, this is more than just woo-woo. There's something there. I don't exactly know how it works, but the metaphor that the Reiki teachers give you is a fine metaphor from, for me to use to replicate that experience. It's a way of getting myself into a state where the placebo effect can actually work. And so I, I consider most spiritual beliefs, one way to think about them is just it's a metaphor. It's a model of reality. It might not be accurately describing the mechanism of how reality works, but it's a model that predicts something about reality. And by the way, that's the same with pretty much every model in reality, even deeply scientific models. At the end of the day, they're still models. Reality is still probabilistic, even down at the quantum level. So even though some models are highly predictive and highly accurate, at the end of the day, they're not reality. They're just a model of reality. They're the map, they're not the terrain. And so 
at some level, if you listen to a lot of Alan Watts, all of reality is just wiggles of energy that our consciousness is observing. And we've given names to them and concepts. Let's call this an atom and let's call this a molecule and let's call this a screen and a camera. Like those things are just made up concepts. There's nothing fundamentally about this set of wiggles of energy that's a monitor other than humans decided to give that collection of wiggles of energy a name called monitor, right? And it's it's the same with any model. So in some sense, like woo-woo models, maybe they're, they're not as predictive as like physics models, but they're still predictive and you should decide for yourself how predictive they are and whether you want to incorporate them in your belief system or not. Yeah, I think our definitions are blurry because, and by blurry, it's not objective because on an objective level or as close to objective we can see is it's just a, a collection of neurons firing. And based yep. on that, you think about whatever definition, there is not one true definition. It's just an idea. And, and then what's interesting is based on whatever definition you choose, it, it creates different experiences. So if you believe in a law of attraction, for example, that literally changes the actual objective definition in your brain. If you believe in the law of attraction, different neurons fire compared to if you don't believe in a law of attraction. And that's extremely interesting because it's not only saying that definitions or beliefs are subjective, is that saying definitions are obje uh, are objective, but based on the context or based on the person, like it is true that I, let's say I believe in the law of attraction and something happened, I, I think that's true. But what I'm saying that's true is not the thing that's actually true, but it's the experience that gets manifested in my mind. That's true. Yeah. Or like the firing that's Yeah. True. I mean, your and beliefs I, affect your actions and your actions affect your reality. So your beliefs are affecting your reality 100%. I think it's actually pretty easy to explain the law of attraction at a fundamental level. Once you've become very clear on what it is that you want, which is why I always encourage entrepreneurs to become clear in what they want before they start a company. But once you become clear in what you want, you're programming a subconscious filter to start looking for opportunities to get what you want. And so if you become clear that I want a million dollars, you're going around in life now subconsciously looking for opportunities to make a million dollars. And you'll notice opportunities that you wouldn't have previously noticed if you hadn't calibrated your filter in that way. And so you will tend to get more opportunities to make a million dollars and may actually make it and then say, oh yeah, the law of attraction worked. But I think the mechanism of how it works is actually pretty simple to explain. And yeah, your, your notion about like truth and objective truth and or subjective truth, there's actually a really interesting spiritual teacher I was listening to a month or two ago in my morning meditations. And he had this, his name's Adi Da. He's a teacher of one of my spiritual teachers. He had this concept called the world is a psychic phenomenon. And when you really, really think about it at a really deep level, when you're sitting and seeing something happen in front of you or you're thinking something inside your head, two things are, are happening that your consciousness is aware of. But is there any actual difference between the thing that happened in your head or the thing that happened in front of your eyes? Are they qualitatively different in any way? They're both just manifestations of something occurring to you in, in your consciousness. So the entire world in that sense is just a psychic phenomenon that exists only in your conscious awareness of it. There's no difference between the thing happening outside in front of your eyes or the thing happening inside of your head. They're both just things happening in consciousness that you are in this moment aware of. Yeah. I'm going back to when we talked about how sometimes even if the mechanism like law of attraction saying that there's some quantum waves that aligns when you believe in the universe. And even if the mechanism is not true, it still works. Usually people would dismiss that as they would call things subjective, objective. One other term I recently coined to try to conceptualize this better, I call it the approximation ladder. Whereas true objectivity is when you try to climb that up into the highest possible resolution. But the problem is that's pretty yep. much impossible. You don't know how neurons work. We don't know how our brains work fully yet. And true objectivity is trying to predict what exactly are the equations that's in my brain. Because like you said, everything is your psyche. Everything is your perception of reality. But going back to the approximation ladder, what's interesting here is that there's this trade-off. The higher resolution that you go, or the, the more accurately you try to approximate something, 
the less efficient it is. And the, the lower you go in that ladder, the more efficient it usually is, right? Because the higher resolution mm -hmm. often takes much more brain power to execute. Well, that's why we have maps, right? A maps, maps are an approximator, approximation of the terrain and they're a simplification and they don't have all the detail. If we tried to create a map with as much detail as reality, it would be just as big as reality and it would have no predict or have no real value. So models are always going to be simplifications of reality and inaccurate. And I think your approximation ladder is a representation of that, like how close to reality do we want it to be? And therefore how complex do we want that model to be? At some point, the complexity is too much for us to do anything with, with our you know, brain's processing power. Yeah, and then that connects back with the dilemma of choosing intuition and rational mind. First of all, even like within yeah. rational, right? There's different levels of that approximation ladder. I think there's yeah. a lot more to be uncovered in that lower aspect or the lower resolution aspect. I think that's where spiritual reality yeah. where that comes in. Well, yeah, to really talk cool. about subjectivity versus objectivity and to talk about, you know, the, the predictive power of, or us. So you, in order to have this conversation, it's, you have to actually start asking some deeper questions. Like if you want to talk about subjectivity versus objectivity, you got to ask yourself, what's the subject? Who is the subject that's, perceiving subjectively versus objectively like who are you are you your body probably not because all the cells in your body constantly dying and changing and the cells that you have now are different to the cells when you were born so there's something other than your body is it like the neuron structure in your brain that's you like you as the subject Maybe it is, but then we can have some kind of thought experiments of if we recreated the exact neuron structure of your brain in an AI, is that AI you or is there something else? And I tend to believe there's something else, which is where it gets into the spiritual realm because science can't really talk about this stuff. I listen to like the Dalai Lama, who's like the most scientific Buddhist that I can think of. There's, there's this, this idea of self that exists outside of the body and the neuron structure in your brain. Is it a soul or is it? a mind stream or a consciousness or whatever name you want to give to it. I don't know, like words can't really talk about this, this concept. And it's only when you understand who is the subject or the you that you're talking about, that you can start to talk about is, is reality subjective or objective. And I actually have convinced myself that free will doesn't exist. There is no like me making a rational decision about something or me making an intuitive decision about something a decision is happening as a result of a causal chain of events that extends all the way back to the big bang. And there's, there's this illusion that I have as part of that sequence of events happening in consciousness that I am somehow a, an individuated self that is somehow an actor in this stream of events. And I am an actor, but what is causing me to act? Like when I have a thought, I decide to pick up this glass instead of that coffee cup, I think I decided to pick up the glass, but how did I decide? Where did the decision to pick up the glass come from? Where was it sourced from? An interesting way to think about this, is our brain a computer or is it an antenna? Like, is it receiving somewhere somehow the instructions of what to do or is it computing somehow the instructions of what to do? It's, it's a really difficult thing to talk about and I can't say I have all the answers by any means but it's a, a very fun thing to contemplate when you get really deep about who am I who is the self and who is the one making these decisions intellectually or intuitively so I actually believe intuitive decisions are maybe more accurate because they're not they're not muddy muddied by the mind getting in the way and trying to like assert some kind of egoic control on it it's more just a natural manifestation of the sequence of causal events happening in the universe in this moment right now, which I may think is free will, but it's actually not. And if I just follow my intuition more and my, I might have an, a time, an easier time of it, less suffering than trying to believe that I have some say over what's happening and therefore suffer when I don't get what I think I'm supposed to get. But this is a whole rabbit hole. I'm not sure we should go down right now. I think we should. I think that's really interesting. So my whole thought process on free will not like the directly the opposite, but somewhat. So what I mean by that is I try to view like the question of free will, not just as the literal question, because I don't think there's much value in just thinking of it as like an equation because there's no way to know. So therefore I think about what is the concept of free will that's in my mind? And then what's the most useful concept 
for me to choose? Is it more useful for me to believe in yep. that I have control with that? It's a very pragmatic me? approach. This is what my past thing used to be, but you just challenged that significantly is that my past thinking was it would be better to believe in free will because we have the illusion of free will anyways. And, and therefore, if, if we believe in free will, it gives us more control. Therefore, we get to choose whatever reality we want to live in. And I derive a, a lot more yeah. comfort, a lot more fulfillment from the fact knowing that I get to choose what type of reality I want to live in. But you talked about where you rather see the opposite, where you see much more utility in believing that you don't have free will, because then the gap between expectation and reality is much lower. And you can just let your natural intuition flow uh, without having this cognitive dissonance. I need it to go this way. Well, it's a case of the right tool for the right job, I would say. Like I 100% agree with and believe in your pragmatic approach like whether free will exists or not doesn't actually matter all that matters is how does my belief of it existing or not affect my reality and my moment by moment experience i like sometimes sitting on the meditation cushion and contemplating these big questions of is there free will and does time exist and who am i whatever because i find it interesting but at the end of the day i don't spend I don't spend most of my day sitting on a meditation cushion contemplating. That's not my karma. I start companies. I, you know, have a family. I do things in the world. And those things are all, all require very pragmatic decision making. And so when I'm coaching entrepreneurs on aspects of spirituality, I don't usually go down the contemplative path. Sometimes I do because it's fun. It's more like pragmatically, how does your belief system affect your day to day experience of happiness and inner peace or suffering and anxiety, taking action and getting what you want or, you know, sabotaging yourself from getting what you want. There's very pragmatic realities that occur as a result of your beliefs. And so for that reason, I like to play with exploring beliefs for a pragmatic reason of affecting your, your experience of reality. So sometimes I might find it being a, a very pragmatic reason to, reside myself in the resign myself in the fact that there's no free will and I'm along for the ride that's very useful in moments of like high stress like something's just gone wrong in your life and you're very upset like I just had a, a big annoying thing happen to me yesterday with a tenant in, in my house in LA and it's it would put me in this really like bad frame of mind for like 24 hours the only way I could dig myself out of it is just getting to that state of equanimity like stuff's happening and my consciousness is aware of that stuff happening. There's nothing inherently good or bad about that stuff happening. And I probably can't affect it anyway. So why cause myself suffering by being upset about it? So there's a very pragmatic reason to use these notions of free will or lack of free will if it helps you achieve a state of equanimity. Other times when I'm running my company, I have to believe in free will. Otherwise, why am I spending all my time like arranging meetings and building products and like doing things? I'm doing that because I believe that I can somehow affect the world, even if it's an illusion. Like I have to believe that in order for me to take those actions. And so there's no like hard and fast, I believe this and I'm a fundamentalist, no free will person. Like it's it's a tool, the tool chest. At the end of the day, free will is just a word that humans made up. Does it even mean anything? If If reality is just a wiggle of energy being observed by consciousness, does anything beyond that matter? Like it's all just made up models anyway and if those models serve you use them if they don't don't coming back to the thesis of the show which is about mental model one direct actional step i think people can implement is seeing any belief such as is there a free will and seeing these questions is is it a useful belief to have rather than just yeah. is this true right normally in these debates people just go back and forth like quantum mechanics so there is is no free will or something but oftentimes when and when you think about this approximation ladder, or actually just now, I think that term is actually, I don't think it's a good term to describe what it really is. I think a better term is actually calling it like approximation pyramid or approximation like triangle. Mm -hmm. uh, because the lower that you mm -hmm. go, the more possibilities that there are. When we go as low as, and it's low resolution as uh, when we talked about whether free will exists, right? which free will is very subjective. It's our own conceptualization. It's not like science or mathematics or logic. Or that's much more higher resolution. When you're dealing with that lower resolution, there's so much room that you can move around as you go down that triangle. Mm. 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 Yeah, no, totally. I think mental models should be chosen consciously 
for the intended purpose or an intended purpose. Like the, the best we can hope to achieve in our life is expanding our conscious awareness of what's going on in the moment. So the more unconscious your mental models or subconscious filters or programming is, and the more you're just playing that out unconsciously, the less control you have or the less perceived control you have and probably the more suffering you have in your life. But if you can shine the light of conscious awareness on your subconscious, your mental models, and just be aware of what's happening, that's really the most we can we can hope for. Being aware of what's happening and not being not causing suffering for ourselves based on, on that. So being aware of everything and maintaining equanimity. Those are the two fundamental like pieces that I, I learned from a, a meditation that I was on, like an 11 day meditation last year where I was using the Vipassana technique. And the technique is to be as aware as you possibly can of every little sensation happening in your body right now. Like if you could feel every cell in your body simultaneously, what does that feel like? And most of us are barely aware that we even have a body. Most of the time we go around so much in our head. I've asked you to feel your pinky finger. You, you'll now feel it, but I guarantee you weren't feeling it before I said that. If you could enter a state somehow where you're aware of your entire body all the time in every moment, you'll realize how much stuff's going on in there. There's like huge waves of like, things that feel good, things that feel bad, painful, happy, but maintaining equanimity because just knowing that all those sensations are just momentary anyway and they're all arising, they're all passing away in any given moment. And if you can just be aware of them, notice them happening and say, okay, great, no big deal, that happened. Putting those two together, full awareness and equanimity is a formula you can use in, in life in, in general. So when you when you have these mental processes happening with these mental models try and bring full awareness to them so that you at least know what's happening in your mind and in your body and in, in the moment then don't like cause suffering for yourself based on that also just like notice that's what's happening with equanimity and do what you got to do but you know a lot of us we, we cause suffering for ourselves unnecessarily because we don't we aren't getting what we think we should be getting or vice versa there's some deep connection with self-awareness and why we feel that way for it. Actually, a mentor of mine, he believes that self-awareness is happiness. I'm curious what you think of that. There's something interesting. Immediately, one thought that jumps to mind uh, is I think self-awareness has a direct relationship with the amount of suffering in life. And, and the reason I think behind that is it changes you what it, it changes execution versus reality, but you also understand the, the, the mechanism behind why excitation does not meet reality. And we derive a lot of comfort from that because one, now we can take action against it to meet our reality or just like be peace with it. Like when we, when we just feel negatively, we can use philosophies like stoicism to overcome that. Now, I'm curious yeah. why that is, even ask even deeper questions under there. Like why is it that self-awareness causes that why is it that by being aware it puts us in this special emotional state so i, I definitely get what you mean so we're talking about self-awareness and i think what you're getting at is like self-awareness can actually create more suffering right or it can create in these heightened emotional states is that is that where you were going that's actually the, the contention there yeah theoretically like that could happen right but also somehow it doesn't I think actually it does. Yeah. So I think suffering is a hundred percent self-inflicted, right? It's just based on our reaction to events that occur in, in reality, but it is definitely correlated with increased self-awareness. So first we've got to start with the term self-awareness. Like we talked about earlier, like what is the self that's aware here at some point, you know, you have to, ask yourself, does the self even exist? So I like to just call it awareness. Like there's a scale of how aware you are. At the at the bottom end of the scale, your awareness is a singular focus on one little thing. Like right now I'm singularly focused on your image in the computer screen and I'm not really aware of anything else that's going on around me. And most of us spend most of our day in that state of singular focused awareness. And it's a useful state to be in sometimes, but, but we're in it far too often. We should actually spend more of our life in a, an expanded, more global awareness. But it's the same thing you'll practice in meditation, right? When you're doing Vipassana meditation, you practice holding your focus on the sensation of the air passing over your 
nostril as it comes in and you put all your awareness in that spot. Then you can have a more global awareness where your goal is to be aware of as much as possible in any given moment. So you can practice like, what am I hearing right now? What am I seeing? What am I tasting? What am I feeling? What am I smelling? How is that changing? What am I thinking? And being aware of what's happening outside and what's happening in the room. And, you know, if you go really spiritual with it, you start to ask questions like, can I feel what's happening on the other side of the earth right now? And some spiritual teachers claim they can and, and maybe they can, I don't know. So increasing your awareness, I think, is a, an evolution of or a, a better way to spend your conscious consciousness. Like what is consciousness? What is our time on this earth other than to be like aware of stuff that's happening as much as possible? So it's a good practice to expand your awareness and expand your ability to be aware of stuff. So at some point when you start to put that awareness onto this body or this mind, and I might call that self-awareness, what am I feeling right now? What am I thinking right now? You can unlock a lot of suffering if you don't couple that with equanimity or stoicism, I think you called it similar, because the more aware you are of the currents of energy flowing around your body as a, in the form of emotions or in the form of tension or whatever else it may be, the more like the more intensity you'll feel. My My path of growth in my own personal life has been one of over the last few decades unlocking more sensation and more emotion in my body because for whatever reason as a result of my childhood i i learned it was better to repress emotion and be very analytical and rational in my decision making and in my actions and for some reason some set of experiences when i was too young to remember i formed the belief that feeling strong emotions were somehow bad and should be repressed now that can help sometimes if you're feeling overwhelming, like negative emotions that you can't even do anything, being able to like squash that with your rational mind and press it down and say, let's just get done what we've got to get done. That can be a useful tool. I'm sure it was biologically evolved because sometimes when you're scared shitless of the saber tooth tiger, you've got to press that down and like go fight it or run. So you can't always just be at the mercy of your emotions. But at the same time, if you repress your negative emotions, you're also repressing your positive emotions. So you'll never experience the great bliss and joy that's possible from like being fully present to everything that's happening in this moment. I think great happiness can come from being more aware of the moment. So with more awareness comes more of the good and more of the bad. And if you don't have control of your reaction to those intense sensations, you can definitely cause suffering for yourself. If I focus on being aware of what's going on in my body right now and what's going on is this intense, like negative feeling of being annoyed about my tenant from my house yesterday or something that causes a lot of suffering and stewing for myself. Cause like, oh, I don't like this feeling. I want it to stop. And like wanting something other than what is right now is suffering. At some point you just have to say, I'm feeling this feeling in my body it feels like some kind of warm sensation in my solar plexus and this like burning sensation in my scalp or whatever it may feel like observe what that is and know that that's just something that is right now and will go away sometime in the future and it doesn't mean anything and i'm not gonna i don't have to react to it as like oh, i wish that would stop i can react to it as like oh that's interesting and same thing happens when you're going through like great positive emotions you can get caught up you can get too caught up in it. Like it feels good. But if, if you get too like addicted to that feeling so that when it goes away, which it inevitably will, because nothing is constant, it's all coming and going. If you then cause yourself suffering because you want that thing back, you crave that feeling of ecstasy. That's just another form of suffering. So this, this is a very Buddhist teaching, I guess, that I'm talking about right now, but maintaining equanimity in, to all sensation, being aware of it, completely aware of everything, but also maintaining equanimity in the face of everything is the key to inner peace. And you've got to start from inner peace before you can achieve happiness. Cause I think inner peace coupled with like action and energy and doing something is, is happiness. When you talk about repressing emotion, I really resonate with that. Cause that was for me too. When I was young, I was always mm -hmm. taught like it's partly Asian culture. I literally mm -hmm. like got goosebumps as soon as you said that. Which is interesting. There's, I mean, there's some interesting science there yeah. that we could totally imagine about. Like, why do we get goosebumps? What does that mean? But we, we can talk about that later yep. if we have time. However, what I'm most interested in <laughs> right now is thinking about what actually is awareness. 
what do you think it is? Because it's almost mm-hmm. a sixth sense, right? We have the sense of yep. touch. Being aware of the yep. sense of touch is like a new sensation. Like it's, it's a different sensation than just touching directly. And being aware of our emotions is a different yep. sensation than just having emotions. Where do you think that awareness comes Having from? emotions, yep. Oh my God, you're asking the deepest spiritual question you can possibly ask because at some point you've got to, so I, I kind of see awareness and consciousness as almost interchangeable terms. Like to, to be aware that something is happening is to be conscious, right? Like, so if you want to ask yourself, like, what is consciousness? <laughs> what is awareness? Like the, there's, there's no deeper existential question that will lead you to enlightenment than being able to find the answer to that question. And I haven't found it yet, but this is, you can spend decades meditating on this question alone. And and fundamentally that's what meditation is. Like you can use meditation to do things like calm down if you need to calm down or, I don't know, get in touch with your body or get it. I mean, there's many things you can use meditation for, but fundamentally, if you practice meditation for long enough, you're trying to ask the question, who am I? And what is consciousness? So you're trying to quiet like everything as much as possible so that I'm just sitting still. I'm not moving. I'm not, I actually meditate with my eyes open, but you can close your eyes. So you're not distracted by visuals. You're in a quiet room. So you're not distracted by sounds when everything's gone as much as you possibly can, or you can get into a sensory deprivation float tank, right? Where there's no light, there's no sound. The water is the same temperature as your body. So you don't really feel it. You're floating. So you don't really feel gravity. Everything's a go gone and yet you're still aware like you still know that you exist you still know that you're alive whatever that means you're still like aware of awareness like you're still aware that you are i don't know how to say it and so what is that like what is that most fundamental awareness it's like it's a miracle really like it's 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 the if you ask yourself what's the difference between like programming an AI with the exact same neurons as my brain and it can solve all the same problems that my brain can solve in exactly the same way as I can solve them, would it have that fundamental piece of being aware that it is (laughs) or is it just a non-aware program? Like I don't think we can even answer that question, but contemplating that question i think is how you kind of tease apart like what is consciousness what is awareness from like what is the content of that awareness and so you know i don't have a good answer for you other than you have to practice and see for yourself try and sit there and try and tune in focus your awareness on awareness itself like what does it feel like to be aware of awareness and then what is it that's aware of awareness And you're aware that that thing is aware of awareness. And so there's like turtles all the way down. You you keep kind of going back at some point, like what is the fundamental like source of all of this? This is the deepest spiritual question that you could possibly ask and definitely fun to play with it. And you can spend a lifetime, you can spend many lifetimes (laughs) playing with it. And I do enjoy playing with it, but I definitely can't give you the answer. One thought that came to mind of thinking, why is it so hard? To understand something like this, I think connecting back to the approximation triangle, potentially there, there's a point at which if you conceptualize that triangle, there might be holes in it. And what I mean by that is what's interesting is that as you go higher and higher resolution, the more c- computational power there is. So there is one argument of consciousness that we can never understand it because it just takes too much computing power and we just don't have that. But another way to look at it, also you talk about the law of attraction, all the spiritual things, you have to go really low on that approximation ladder to be able to even feel it and be aware of that. Potentially, it's like understanding consciousness could be between those in a way where you can never actually understand it. As in, it is so complex that you need a lot of rational awareness of it. But at the same time, To be aware of that, you have to be in this low resolution emotional feeling. That's what meditation gets us closer to the feeling of consciousness. And it's almost as if this rational state Mm -hmm. of mind and emotional state of mind cannot coexist to an extent where we can understand consciousness fully. Like when you're rational, you can't be aware. It it can't because it's a subset 
of consciousness. So you, you're right that you can't understand consciousness with your rational mind, but that's not to say you can't understand consciousness. You just can't understand it rationally with your mind. There's plenty of people that have achieved enlightenment or awakening or whatever you want to call it, like Buddha, and Jesus and other spiritual figures reached a point where they saw it for what it is like they saw reality for what it is and consciousness for what it is and themselves for who they are like they they got there and they can't like explain it to you in a rational way i'm sure many have tried the best they can do is say like here's how i got there and here's some practices you should do you should meditate every day for example you should pray every day whatever it may be but it's not something you're going to arrive at with rational thinking because rational, your rational mind is a subset of conscious awareness and you can't understand the whole thing using only a subset of it. The only way you can truly understand all of consciousness is by being consciousness, which you are. You're conscious. You're fully aware right now. You are consciously aware. You just forget. Like you're in a moment, you, you can sit down, meditate, and become aware, I am awareness, I am consciousness. You can actually feel that in a second. And in that moment, you are no less conscious than Buddha was when he achieved enlightenment. Like you're as conscious as possible in that moment. The problem is it's going to to last like half a second and then you're back to like thinking about what am I going to have for dinner and what am I going to do to work tomorrow? And you get lost in all the stuff that's going on. You can't maintain, you can't stabilize that state of conscious awareness. With practice over many years of meditating or other paths you can stabilize that conscious awareness and and maybe even live all the time as consciousness i don't know if anyone truly can live all the time as consciousness i think we all drop into our minds but you're only going to understand it by being consciousness and not trying to break apart what consciousness is with your rational mind it's just it's not going to work so one connection here i think is recursion in computer science and the reason i bring that up i think Recursive problems are ones that are usually hardest to solve and hardest to figure out. There's some connection between that and chaos. I don't know the exact computational theory of that. So uh, if anyone's listening that has a lot of experience in like deep mathematics, I would love to you know chat. But there's some connection there. And what's interesting is I think awareness could be trying to solve this massively recursive problem. It's like you, you have awareness, but then you have to be aware of being aware. But it's not only recursive, but yep. it also connects with many other like senses as well, because you would be aware of a sense. Now, where recursion yep. is interesting, and this is purely based on intuition and empirical data. So some of the smartest people or the most people that have the most novel thoughts that I've known. I like one guy, he's like a YouTuber philosopher. And I, I was talking to him about the Goldell's incompleteness theorem. So it basically just says any system must be incomplete. So any model that you try to describe the world in, it must lack some ability to predict some future of the world. And the first question he asked me compared to like many other people that I know, but he's a philosophical. And the first question that he asked me was, does the Goldell's incompleteness theorem also include itself? And that's almost like a skill of noticing recursion. And I only find that in people who are very philosophical. But again, this is only based on, you know, anecdotes. I don't know how accurate this is out of all people, but it seems like that's a pretty foundational skill. I can see a lot of philosophers doing. It's like always asking recursive uh, or trying to find that root of that. What do you think recursion has to do with self-awareness and spiritual? Well, it's, it's absolutely recursive because you're trying to become aware of awareness and you're trying to use awareness to become aware of itself like it's it's for sure recursive and you can never understand it without stop trying to understand it and just be aware like it, it's kind of your in, in your approximation pyramid right the the top of it is is when your model is so high resolution that it's equivalent to reality right and so your model is so large and complex and high resolution it's not trying to explain reality it is reality And it's the same thing if you want to understand what awareness is. You've got to stop trying to understand what awareness is and you have to just be aware. Like you have, it is reality. You're not trying to describe reality or simplify reality so that you can explain it to someone else. It's impossible. If you want to understand reality at the fullness of what reality is, 
just be aware of this moment fully and stop trying to simplify it because you can't, any simplification of reality is no longer reality. So that's what meditation fundamentally is. You're trying to sit there and just be aware. And it's a lot harder than it sounds to, because you always find your mind is doing some junk and, you know, you're feeling things and reacting to them, but can you just be aware of this moment fully? <laughs> like if you can, and you can stabilize that, then there's nowhere further to go. And I think the people that are attracted to asking these kind of questions like I am or attracted to philosophy and trying to understand existence is because, you know, we spend our lives using our, say engineering minds or our rational minds to try and break down problems and solve them. And we apply those skills to programming and to building businesses and to creating things. At some point, like you keep applying that same, the same skills of abstracting problems and breaking things down and thinking of things like recursion, you, you keep taking it further and further, like outside of just your computer and your business, but to your day-to-day -day existence. And at some point you're like, you're going to encounter reality and you're going to start applying those same techniques and, and tools to it. And that's, that's why we, people like us enjoy philosophy so much. It's in, at some level, it's like intellectual masturbation. Like there's no real, like you're not going to figure out the answer just by talking about it, but it's fun to talk about it. The answer is not talking about anything. It's just being, but we can, we can help accelerate our, each other's journey towards that learning how to be by giving these tools and techniques through rational discourse and through philosophical conversations. Under that point, my current belief is that it is possible to get to the highest resolution of almost anything. Maybe it won't fit in our brains, but I truly believe that. And I think newer discoveries in computer science can help us get closer to there. So as an example, thinking about solving the exploitation exploration dilemma, one algorithm is the epsilon greedy algorithm which is basically explore 10% of the times or, and exploit 90% of the time or set whatever value there is. And that's a really mm -hmm. good algorithm to solving, solving these exploit, explore problems on an infinite time scale. The, someone who's always exploring, applying this algorithm in their own life, they might try opportunities like YC, but still exploiting and still having something that they work on so they don't jump around. Like it's always going to do better than what typically people do, which is not have this high resolution understanding of these computer science problems or these engineering problems and rather they just go by whatever their intuition says which most of the time actually is just to exploit for most people so i think yeah. there's a possibility of applying the same engineering mindset to even solve awareness i could be very wrong on this but right now i think what if there's specific computational algorithms like epsilon greedy but likely for recursion it's much more complex but what if there are these algorithms that can help re solve recursive problems like awareness and maybe we just haven't discovered them yet. But are you familiar with any of those recursion solving algorithms? Well, it's an interesting question. I've never thought about it in that way. But I just think the framing of the problem of solving awareness might not be like the right framing. I don't think it's a problem to be solved. It's an experience to be understood. And I just think fundamentally from first principles, it can't be understood by any model because any model is by definition lower resolution than the fullness of it, like reality, awareness of this moment, whatever you want to call it. I can try and like create a model of what that re that awareness of reality is and, and something that I can explain to you or put into an algorithm, but it's always only going to be a model. And maybe that's fine. Like that's what philosophy is. Let's like try and compress reality down to a model and transmit it to another human and they'll process it and transmit something back. And that's, that's fun. Like I talked about intellectual masturbation, but it's, and it can also help us grow. But if you really want to experience it, there's no other way than being at full resolution. If you really want to experience and understand the fullness of it, no models ever going to explain the fullness of it. You just have to be, and you're already aware you are you are already fully aware you were born with the ability to be a hundred percent aware of the moment in fact babies when they're first born are probably like buddha enlightened they're just a hundred percent aware there's no mind process going on there's no filters there's no like junk it's just like wow this is reality i'm alive and i think we're just trying to get back to that state again with all of these 
you know, spiritual practices or philosophical questioning or meditation on just what reality is. It's just trying to get us back to just being. Wow. What experiences led up to that conclusion? Could you share some of the spiritual learning? Oh my God. There's, there's so, so many things that have led to this. So I've been on like a, a decade long journey of trying to ask some of these deeper questions. I spent the first part of my career in my rational mind, engineering mind, starting companies, doing all that stuff we talked about. And at some point, it was around like 2012, 2013, I started to get this intuitive feeling that there's more to this than just supercharging my rational mind. And I started to get the feeling that my intuitive side, my creative mind, like the left brain, right brain analogy, whatever you want to call it, I should start giving more weight to that intuitive side and start following my intuition more and just noticing what things I was curious about and interested in. And I became really interested for a moment in this this idea that in our current society, there's no rite of passage that boys go through to become men. I think in older societies, tribal societies, they tended to have these rituals, like an adolescent in the tribe would go and complete some difficult task and be anointed. You're now like a, a man in the tribe. And I think this causes a real problem because I think, I mean, this is a whole other topic I don't want to go down, but masculinity and in our current society is a little bit broken and we don't have enough men claiming manhood. We have a lot of older males still acting like boys or children and not really stepping into what it means to be a powerful adult. I think it's less of a problem for women because women have much stronger biological processes that happen. They, they basically, but it's, if, if you're a woman and you have given birth, you're no longer a, a girl, you're a mother now and something has seriously hormonally and mentally changed in you, but men don't really have that to the same extent. And so I started thinking about, okay, older societies used to have all these rituals. I need to do a ritual for myself. And I started researching vision quests, which, which is what Native Americans would do. The adolescents would go out on a vision quest and come back to the tribe and share their vision and become a man of the tribe. And so I did a vision quest. I went to Death Valley, California. I was living in San Francisco at the time. I went and slept on a mountain for four days by myself with um, no food. I had water. There was no one around for miles. I had other people that were doing vision quests at the same time. So we had a kind of rough support network, but no one knew exactly where I was and I didn't know exactly where anyone else was. And I sat there on this mountain. I had a sleeping bag, but no tent or anything. And I, I slept in the howling winds at night and I walked around in the sun during the day and I just contemplated like what it means to be a man and what do I want to embody as a man in, in my life. And I wrote a manifesto to myself in my journal of this is what I believe it is to be a man. And I created rituals for myself as I like woke up on, on the, I stayed up at, on the final night as the kind of full moon rose and I sat there like watching the full moon rising over the desert and sinking on the other side and the sun coming up and at sunrise like stepped over a, a kind of a ceremonial line that I made with the rocks in the sand saying I'm stepping out of boyhood and I'm stepping into manhood and this kind of rituals train or communicate with your more reptilian mind you know in a way much stronger than any rational thought will and it really like can change your subconscious belief system so I came back from that with a claim on manhood and a manifesto of what I want to be as a man. And that was like the beginning of my spiritual journey. And I started following a lot of intuition when I would meet someone who's something resonated with me. I would ask them, like, tell me more about these beliefs you have, introduce me to someone else. And through just following these chains of people and intuition, I found a lot of spiritual teachers that I ended up working with. I found a lot of like shamanic teachers that I ended up working with, with, you know, plant medicines and other kind of entheogenic substances. I've, I've done a lot of, you know, reading obviously in like mental contemplation of, of these concepts, a lot of meditating practices. So it's a, it's an amalgamation of a lot of different sources. I think my most powerful and main spiritual teacher is a man named David Data, who's written a lot of books and I've spent a lot of time with him in person at, at workshops He's the the person I've encountered in my life who's the most enlightened. If there's anyone that I've met personally that sees reality as close to high resolution objectivity as possible, like he's it. And having a conversation with him and having him explain stuff to you is like bolts of like clarity from someone who you know is seeing a lot more than you're seeing. But I've also gotten that myself through like plant medicine or 
the most intense was this substance. It's actually a venom that comes from a toad that, that lives in Mexico. And this is like the most intense, profound, crazy experience I've ever had in my life. But I, I found this shaman from Mexico who's been working with these toads for decades and even wrote a book on it. What he does is he catches these toads at night in the desert and milks the venom out of their venom sacs. And you can only milk them like once a year. I think he actually has a farm where he breeds these toads and you dry it out into this powder and then you like vaporize it and inhale the vapor. And it's, it's something that lasts like 15 minutes, but it's, it's something that is so like mind shatteringly intense and bizarre. You just have no concept of time when it happens. You know, he put this, you know, this powdered venom to my mouth and put put his lighter and said, okay, breathe in. I'm going to count to 10, one, two, three, four, up to 10. And I'm just inhaling, inhaling, inhaling. And I was like, hold it, hold your breath. And I'm going to count down from like 10 to one. And when I get to one, just, I just want you to surrender and relax. And so I'm sitting in, in inside in a room, just me and him, and I'm on a bed and I'm holding this vapor in my, in my throat, my lungs. And he's going 10, 9, 8. And I kind of like lay back on the bed and he's like 3, 2, 1, surrender. And I can just like, well, I, I, even right now when I remember this moment, it's so so intense. It's like creating all these goosebumps. But in that moment, he just said surrender. It was like reality just dissolved. Like there was no longer, I didn't exist. Like the notion of me as some individual conscious entity separate from anything else in reality was completely dissolved. They call it ego death. Like this, the ego as in sense of self goes away and you no longer experience yourself as a self, Like you are no longer conscious of anything. You just are consciousness. I don't even know. It's some, I can try and put it in words. I'm never going to get close to what the experience was like, but for 10 minutes, I was just consciousness, nothing other than just pure awareness no awareness of that I'm a body or that I'm a human or that I'm a person called Ryan. I was just like aware of everything. I don't know. It's probably what it feels like to, I honestly feel like this is what happens when you die, actually. Like you just dissolve into like conscious awareness of everything. But the beauty of this substance is, is, you know, you come back again after 10, 15 minutes. And so I started to like regain some sense of like, oh, actually I'm, a human lying on a bed, feeling things. Oh, and I slowly started to kind of coagulate again back into this individuated consciousness. But in that liminal state between like before I was fully back and when I wasn't fully gone, I could kind of play with this notion of here's what it feels like to be me in my body. Now here's what it feels like to be everything. And here's what it feels like to be, you know, my girlfriend at the time. I kind of literally just experimented with myself embodying her and i felt myself as her it's bizarre to explain and anyway i slowly came back and came back to reality and i had no concept of what i my i was physically doing while i was gone and everyone reacts to this <clears throat> this venom in different ways I, I spoke to the the shaman afterwards to kind of have him describe different experiences people had but apparently when i lay, lay back i felt like i just let out a little like a uh, little sigh but apparently i was just making all these like, like deep throaty, like screaming sounds as I was on the bed, which I have zero recollection of. But when he kind of repeated those sounds back to me, they sounded like these deep ohm sounds. Like it's a very ancient spiritual sound that a lot of, you know, traditions have this like, ohm kind of sound. It, it was a sound like that, that when I heard it for days afterwards, it would take me back to that state. It was super intense. And I had a lot of like situations occur since then that kind of almost took me back to that that place of full open conscious awareness i think that you can get to that state by practicing meditation every day of your life or prayer or different th th i mean there's one truth or there's one like a reality let's call it and there's different paths to discovering that reality i think the use of you know these substances toad venom or, or plants like ayahuasca or whatever it may be can help you get a taste of it and they're kind of an accelerant on that journey if you want to go there they can help you see it and experience it but only if coupled with like doing the hard work yourself because they're, they're never going to create any lasting change in you like that was a one intense 15 minute period in my life that i've never came close to replicating again and i probably could get there if i 
meditated in a cave every day for the rest of my life. But I'm happy having that preview and knowing that the practices, the spiritual practice that I'm doing can kind of get me back towards that. That's the direction of practice that I'm going. So there's no like one answer to how do you approach this question of having full awareness, but there's a lot of tools you can use. And I think some of the best ones are spiritual teachers. There's a lot of wisdom in old spiritual books and recordings of spiritual teachers or, you know, these, these plant medicines are don't underestimate how powerful they can be. I, I felt that not obviously fully, but as you describe your experience, there's, I instantly felt so much more aware of my presence yeah. right now. It's so intense, right? It's, and these are the things that like, who knows why you're feeling that? Who knows the mechanism by which you're feeling that? I could come up with an explanation like, you know, the energy is transmitting through me to you through the universe, which might be true. That might be what's happening. Or it could be that you're subconsciously detecting body language in my body. That's, and it's some placebo effect that makes you feel what I'm feeling. There's mirror neurons that do this as well. Who knows what the mechanism is? It doesn't matter. The point is that you could feel some of what I was feeling. And that happens all the time in, in, in reality. Part of becoming more aware of reality is not just becoming self-aware, aware of what's going on in yourself, but becoming aware of all the people around you, all the consciousnesses around you and how much you influence each other all the time. You, you, one of my spiritual teachers says there's no such thing as private thoughts. You might feel that if you're experiencing something internally, you can kind of keep it to yourself and hidden and that other people won't know. But at some level, everyone always feels and knows everyone around them, even if not consciously, subconsciously. And I find women tend to be better than men at detecting these subtle energetic shifts and emotions in people. But when you tune into it yourself, you can really start to feel other people. And it becomes so important to realize that working on yourself is no longer about self-improvement and self-growth. It's a because you are affecting everyone around you. Anything that you do to yourself is rippling out to everyone around you. And so it's actually a noble pursuit. And it's actually probably a requirement that all of us should work on ourselves because we're in impacting everyone around us by being unconscious to our, our own junk. And we've got to clear that up so that we stop in infecting other people with our own unconsciousness and, th and them to us. A fully enlightened world where we're all working on ourselves and aware of the impact we're having on each other would be a world of, you know, complete peace and happiness. I was having a conversation with uh, my friend about consciousness and what that means. What does it mean to be enlightened? And our current conclusion, or his conclusion right now is when you have no desire, like when you're just fully aware and you have no desire of this needs to go there. Yeah, that's a very that's Buddhist really explanation. When you talked about how it's a noble thing, because noble, once again, is a meaning that we've created for ourselves. And right. according to like the definition of that, it's all subjective and we should just have zero attachment to anything. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, at, at some level, if there's no free will, there's no such thing as like, I'm doing a noble action or not because I'm not doing the action. It's just an action that's happening in, in the moment. But it's a useful model to, to have. I believe that, and, and your most religions or spiritual belief systems have some notion of you should be good to others, some notion of like altruistic tendencies or being having being noble um, in your actions and your thoughts and your speech. And that's, I think, for a reason. Like these religions and spiritual belief systems have been around for thousands of years and, you know, there must be a reason that there's those kind of similarities that exist across all of them from cultures from all around the world. And so there's probably something to living a noble life. Like there's probably something to the idea of living a life where you're trying to improve the lives of those around you. You know, cause you, you could kind of argue like why, like why, why should I try to improve anyone's life? Why humans have no obligation to help each other and make each other better. And you know, that, that may be true, but there's, there's kind of something that feels different when you imagine a society of humans that are all invested in each other's success and growth and happiness and well-being. There's something that this, I can't explain it rationally, it just feels like a better state than if we're all here to like fight each other and kill each other. Like that feels like fundamentally like not good to, to us unless you have maybe some really bad childhood traumas or brain you know, damage or something. But um, for most of us, like it feels better to imagine like a society of people invested in helping each other. And so I think whenever you're in, in doubt of like 
trying to figure out what's my purpose in the world or what am I here to do, putting a lens of on it of how can I serve and how can I help others to grow and get better generally leads towards things that light you up more and give you more energy and make you feel more passionate versus thinking about like, I just want to make a bunch of money so I can buy a boat. Like that feels good. But when you really connect into like, I want to make a billion people's lives better and lift them out of poverty so they can live longer. It just like feels like something that's going to lift you. I mean, if you were working on that every day, you're just, the motivation's going to come much more easily than like, oh, I've got to do this thing I hate just so I can buy my boat. So this, I don't know. I don't know why noble goals are better than selfish goals, but there's something about them that just feels different. I think it has to do with uh, entropy reduction, but that's a whole other theory. Uh, I'll probably make a YouTube video on it eventually. But one other interesting mental model that you used is in a way expanding your time range when you think about exploit and explore. But to, the best way to illustrate what I mean is with an example, especially among hackers or people who like to think for oneself or at least think that they think for themselves and people who are contrarian. Hmm. Their tendency, and I, I used to be like this all the time, is let's try something different. Like, for example, being contrarian is what is the reason to be altruistic? We're just all selfish beings. We're all optimizers. There's no need to be altruistic. And we should actually lean into some kind of negative uh, emotions and like, be okay with it. Be okay with not being noble. And for me, actually, this, this was a few months ago, I think. I was reading the idea of polyamory, and I found that also mm -hmm. interesting. And it was like, that was my immediate contrarian like self. And I love to explore these new ideas. Like, you know what? I need to try that. But what's interesting is you and you and most guys, <laughs> most teenagers, uh, most young guys. And, 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 and but I mean, I said you and most young guys, but by the way, like I went through that myself, like it, I definitely went through a phase where I explored polyamory and I think it's a very natural biological desire because I think we're biologically as, as males programmed to impregnate as many women as possible whereas females tend to experience that feeling less because they have to optimize for having a stable nurturing environment to raise a child and if if the the man that they partner with is off with someone else that's it's not gonna benefit them necessarily but th there's a lot i can say about polyamory versus versus not but ultimately it comes down to a decision of do you prefer like broad and shallow or do you prefer like narrow and deep because you can't go deep with if you're with five women, you can't go to the same depth with any of them as you can if you go really deep with one woman, which is why I'm now married and have, having an amazing wife and going very, very deep spiritually. And there's infinite depth, and I, I like depth. I love the novelty of breadth, don't get me wrong, but the, there's something about that depth that's um, much more appealing to me. Yeah. The, the reason I bring that up connects back with when you think about making those decisions. For me, it wasn't just emotional, like, oh, I want to try this. It was like, I rationally convinced myself that is the most optimal thing, similar to the reasons you gave, but there's some historical context I think that's missing. Like I was just thinking in terms of these, this, this new logic I just created, but I wasn't thinking about the hundreds of years where monogamy has worked so well. And there must be a reason for that, or there must be hidden reasons outside of what I can conceptualize. Like you said, right? The depth thing, that was actually something that I didn't think about that much when I first thought about it. Now, this mental model is the same thing that you used uh, when you're talking about there's there must be a reason why all these ancient figures the spiritual figures all talk about being noble and because of that therefore we should all strive to be that and this also has its own danger that's like are you just following what everyone else is doing but it seems as if what we're currently doing or what you did was one step above that you got the people that just follows what everyone else does and then you got the people that are contrary and want to have higher levels of depth and question things but i think where you got was that you had both of these levels, but then on top of that, you're like, okay, while I'm aware that potentially this new not being noble or like you, you considered all these different possibilities, but you ended up with this thing that's yeah. like, still, there must be a reason for why the world has been the way it is. And you consciously chose to just exploit off of that. I'm curious, when do you decide that? Because obviously you can't yeah. just always exploit. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, a rationalization of assuming that I have some kind of free will and can decide to be noble or not, then I have 
kind of convinced myself that it's better to be noble than not. And there's many reasons for that. One I talked about is just how it feels and you can run this experiment yourself. How does it feel yourself when you're working on something that's helping someone else versus how do you feel when you're working on something that's purely selfish? And decide for yourself, if the purely selfish one feels better, you should do it. You should follow what feels good to you, follow what you want to do. But I think for most people and people alive right now can run this test and you can read historical books about, you know, spiritual teachers in the past and historical events. Like there's, there's a trend towards like nobler things seem to feel better to people. But at the end of the day, all of this is just still a model of reality. It's not reality because even the concept of doing something noble or not to other people means that there must be a self individuated from others. And I question, I would really question whether that's actually true. I think if at the deepest level, you only ever need to be self-interested because the self is no different from the other. <laughs> and I came to this realization through like very deep meditations and actually plant medicine ceremonies that, anything you want to improve in the world and the universe, anything you want to fix or heal, the only action you need to take is heal that in yourself. That's it. And everything else like will flow from there. And so in some sense, you only need to be self-interested because there is no, I think the reason is there is no self and other. It's just an experience. So I think, Fundamentally, the notion of selfishness is actually a noble goal because if we each worked on making ourselves more whole, more healed, more conscious, more loving, like better for whatever better means, if we just focus on developing ourselves and we all did that, there's nothing else to do. But I guess the reality is that some of us tend to grow faster for whatever reason than others or are more committed to self-growth than others are. And so there is also benefit to helping others catch up. Maybe if you want to call it that way, I don't like to like make these judgments that some people are like better than others, but people are certainly more developed in certain areas than other people are. I think that's a pretty non-controversial thing to say. And so if you're more developed in a particular area, feels good to me to help other people develop more in that area. If it didn't feel good to me, I wouldn't do it. I'm not doing it because like some religion says I must do it. I don't take things on faith or dogma. I hate that. I like empirical testing of things myself. And it feels better to me to help other people learn things that I've learned, grow in ways that I've grown. So I do it. And I don't say that everyone should do that run the experiment yourself, but I suspect you'll find it feels pretty good <laughs> Most for most people it does. And I think that's why noble goals, you know, might be more preferable to selfish ones. Do you think that we should always follow that, uh, like our conditionings? I, I guess in s parts of it is definitely genetic. Like I think it just our natural state, as soon as we're born, we're incentivized by genetics to help other people. However, a large part of what we think will make us happy and make us feel good is just natural conditionings, which we can recondition ourselves to like other things. And a lot of my current worldview yeah. has been formed. I should be intentionally reconditioning, a uh, recondition almost anything. Like if I have negative emotions such as jealousy, uh, I should recondition myself to take in like a healthy way. A lot of, I think, people who are getting this self-improvement feel or even anyone who wants to make a difference in the world and build a company is all just reconditioning ourselves to work harder be more productive so how do you balance that well, into your conditioning yeah conditions? i think when you're reconditioning something like jealousy it's not that you're trying to stamp out that feeling of jealousy or you know repress it or get rid of it this ties back to i think a conversation we had in, in the beginning it's it's about in increasing your conscious awareness of what's going on. So be aware that you're feeling jealousy. Many of us might not even be aware when we're feeling jealousy. We're just angry and upset for some reason. I don't like this person for some reason. We might not really understand why. And we can just do a little bit of introspection and realize, okay, I'm actually jealous of this person for this reason. And you can get even, you can 
increase your awareness even more and see how does that jealousy manifest in my body. I feel like my stomach is churning and feel like a lot of energy in my face. I don't know. Just go as deep as you can to being self-aware of what's going on in your body. Awareness. And then the other piece we talked about is equanimity. So like no matter what's going on, don't cause suffering for yourself. Like you're feeling jealousy. So what? Feel it. Feel it as fully as you can and so what? It doesn't mean anything. It just means you're feeling jealousy. It's going to go away in a, in a moment because everything comes and goes. Nothing's permanent. So I think the reconditioning is not so much trying to never feel jealousy. It's trying to learn how to fully feel jealousy and not make it mean anything and especially not make it cause suffering for yourself. I feel jealousy. Okay, cool. Got it. Let me get back to what I want to spend my time on right now. So, you know, if people are really wanting to condition their life for optimal productivity, you've got to connect that back to why you're doing it. You're not trying to be productive just so you can say to your friends, my productivity score is 15 and I'm more productive than you. It's like there's something you're trying to be productive for. There's some underlying drive, some purpose in your life that you're trying to live and something you want to achieve. And so you just have to connect it back to that and ask yourself, is doing this action right now, this set of actions advancing me towards my deeper purpose and therefore is it making me feel more fulfilled? And even if it's something that I feel a negative emotion for doing right now, like I feel really tired and I don't want to like finish this email, but discipline myself and make myself do it because I know that finishing this email is aligned with the actions that I want to take to get me to my higher purpose. And so you've got to like make that connection. You can't just get fixated on the goal of productivity. It's it's why are you trying to be productive? And if you find that you're just so focused on productivity that you're unhappy or you don't have any, any inner peace, you know, you're, you're suffering most of the day, then ask yourself why again? Like, why am I doing all of this? You can kind of get lost in the the, the means and forget about the end. And so... I'm not saying you can have a life free of suffering or it's always going to feel good. It's not always going to feel good. Sometimes it will feel bad, but that feeling bad, it doesn't mean anything. You've got to maintain equanimity during that feel bad and keep acting anyway if that action is aligned with your deeper purpose, which you've determined is what you're here to do. I would love to go on another uh, tangent under here about systems thinking and like metacognition. It, it came from this revelation I've recently had about how like systems are so complex that they're almost, it's impossible to find a root cause for most of them. Like when I feel negatively, my first instinct has always been trying to like reverse engineer that problem and find that root cause. And that's what a lot of mm -hmm. rational people try to do. Why do I feel jealous? How do I change that? Uh, or a better mental model is to completely disregard this notion of root causes. But I know that we have already been chatting for a really long time. So I'd love to chat about that possibly next time or if anyone's listening, just make sure to comment. Let me just say one thing about that before we wrap up and then we can definitely continue that discussion another time. I think when it comes to emotions, think of it more like the weather than like a computer algorithm. So getting to the root cause as if there's one root cause is not, it's probably the wrong analogy. So you're probably not going to, it's probably not going to serve you as well as thinking it more like the weather there's this whole um, notion of like chaotic, chaotic systems, right? And like a butterfly flapping its wings on the other side of the planet can cause a hurricane, you know, through a chain of events or complex things interacting. Emotions have so many root causes or so many different influences and so many factors that are causing you to feel that emotion. There certainly could be one big thing that happened recently that's a big factor in your emotional state, but you've probably experienced many times moments in your life where say something bad happened and it really affected you and the same bad thing happened on another day with a different emotional set of conditions where it didn't affect you that much and you're like ah whatever like this guy said a bad word to me and one day it made me really angry and I want to like punch him another day he said it to me and I'm like ah, he must be having a bad day and it didn't affect me at all so there's no like one root cause to my emotional state there's so many other there's so many things that are interacting in ways that are probably too complex to try and model. 
it's better to think of it more like the weather. We can kind of predict the weather, but it's not always right. And we can't say there's one reason why that cloud's there right now. It's a lot of things that conspire to make that cloud there right now. There's so many topics that we could literally talk about forever, like especially your entrepreneurship journey. I know we completely went down the spiritual path, but if you guys want to see another episode, make sure to just comment down below if you want to see his time at the Y Combinator, part, being a part-time partner, how did he get into there, et cetera. Just comment down below. Now, as always, we always have this bonus section at the end on productivity hacks, mindset hacks, also morning, night routines, habits. So just feel free to give one sentence answers to all these questions. So first question is, okay. what's your product stack? What are all the software that you use? My productivity stack. These days, I've just recently over the last six months pivoted to Rome Research as like my central hub for where I like write things down, organize my notes and systems, and actually now started to use it to generate things like generating tweets. I tweet from within room. So there's that obviously email. I use the, the G, Gmail, Google suite for that, but, but room has been a great discovery this year, this last year for me. I use Todoist on and off for like to-do list management. I'm kind of slacking on it right now. I haven't been keeping it up to date. Honestly, I don't stress over productivity systems as much as I used to, because I think the stress over optimizing productivity is actually what causes a lot of suffering and it becomes a part-time job just to maintain your productivity system. So I orient more towards doing what I feel motivated to do in the moment when I feel motivated and letting that be a guide. Not Yes, I have some obligations that I need to fulfill and responsibilities I need to fulfill. I have meetings on the calendar that I need to do. But I try to keep most of the day as unscheduled as possible for, so I can follow the inspiration when it strikes. It's much easier to get work done in that moment when you first feel the inspiration than it is to stick it on a to-do list and try and regenerate that inspiration at some point in the future. I find that never works for me. So I try to just be flowing with the inspiration. What are your morning and night routine? So I just had a child like two and a half months ago. So they're pretty crazy right now. Although my wife does most of the work, but wake up reasonably early because that's when our daughter wakes up. My morning routine on an ideal day, and I can't say that I'm doing this every day right now, is I wake up, go straight to the meditation cushion and meditate for an hour total. My meditation right now is 30 minutes of just awareness on awareness, followed by 30 minutes of listening to a spiritual teacher because I'm in this mode of trying to ask some of the deeper questions and I find listening to that wisdom after I've been in a state of meditation for 30 minutes is, is really powerful. That usually then inspires some kind of downloads into me where I start getting tons of interesting ideas. So if that happens, I'll jump on my computer and write a bunch of stuff in Rome that can become videos, blog posts or something in the future, but just contemplation around some aspect of life and reality that was flowing in the moment. Then I'll get to, you know, my work. I, I work on a bunch of different startups and projects at the moment. So whatever I've got for that day, if there's meetings or tasks I've got to do, I'll try and get through those. And then I'll, I'll spend some time, either going to the beach, I live five minutes from the beach or going to my, my gym in the garage and doing some weights. Cause you know, you gotta, you gotta exercise the body as well as the, the mind and spirit. And finally, what's one mindset hack that you have like one favorite quote or a model that you can just repeat to yourself to feel better. I think the biggest one is what we've already mentioned a few times. It's equanimity. That's the one I try to practice the most. And it's really hard to practice because emotions or, you know, sensations can be really strong and you just want to not get caught up in it. If it's good, know that that's not going to last. If it's bad, know that's not going to last. Try and just maintain that sense of equity many through it all. Wow. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, well, lastly, where can people find you? Best way is on Twitter, Ryan Juni, or my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash rjuni. Check those out and uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing from, from you if you want to, anyone wants to discuss this stuff in more detail.